Church leaders need and intentional development to help them discover the their With study and leadership, it can be easy to steer up and keep up large numbers. You just never realize how dependent you become on what other people think of you uh, until what other people think of you is bad. Hey everybody and welcome to the Vanderblumen podcast. On this podcast, we focus on helping you learn how to build, run, and keep a great team. I'm your host, Holly, and on this week's episode, William Vanderblumen is interviewing Tolian Chivijan. Now, Tolian has been a church planter. He's been a pastor of a mega church. And a fun fact about him is that he's the grandson of Billy Graham. Now, most recently, you probably have heard Tolian's name in the news as he's had a really difficult summer. He went through a moral failure and stepped down from being the senior pastor at Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. It's been a really difficult time for him and his family. So in this interview, he talks openly and honestly with William about what he's learned during this time, about grace about mercy, about the insecurities that every pastor faces. And one of the lines that he says that I love is how he has learned even more now than ever that Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Let's jump in. Welcome to today's podcast. So glad you could join us as we try and share with you some of the lessons we're learning as we go out and get a bird's eye view of all the great things God's doing in the church. I've had the privilege of running into a new friend, Tullian Chavijan, or Pastor (laughs) Tullian. So many of you may know Pastor Tullian. He has built a great ministry on his own and has really, frankly, been in the news over going through kind of a tough spot Mm -hmm. over the summer. And we had a chance to catch up with him. I want to hear about just your story, like growing up and where you ended up, and uh, particularly about your message, because it kind of all ties into the things that I heard you say you're learning now. Yeah. Born into a Christian home, middle of seven children. God gave me an amazing Christian heritage. My mom is the oldest daughter of Billy and Ruth Graham, so Billy and Ruth Graham were my grandparents, nice. um, which was amazing growing up. People ask me all the time, what was that like? Never felt any pressure to measure up. They never put any pressure on us to measure up or put any pressure on us to be a certain way or to do certain things. Very, very down to earth. We were with them all the time, uh, all the time spent every summer with them. Two of the most down to earth, genuinely humble people I've ever been around in my life. And so God really infused my entire upbringing, journey, story with amazing grace and outrageous mercy and a family that loved me, um, a family that nurtured me. Uh, The flavor of Christianity that was expressed in my home growing up was not legalistic or oppressive. It was warm. It was inviting. It was hospitable. Uh, Christianity was a very attractive thing to me uh, growing up. Uh, From as early as I can remember, my parents taught me how to pray and read the Bible. They discipled all seven of their children very, very well. Home was very loving. But being the middle of seven children, sometimes you're not exactly sure where you fit inside the home. I didn't Mm -hmm. know if I was the youngest of the older three or the oldest of the younger three. Uh, Sometimes I felt like an only child, always felt like a middle child. And so I started to act out about 12, 13, 14 years old. And my lifestyle had become so disruptive to the rest of the household that by the time I was 16 years old, my parents were left with no choice but to say, we love you, but if you're going to continue living this way, you can't live this way under our roof. So they kicked me out of the house at 16. The police actually came that day and escorted me off of my parents' property. I dropped out of high school at that time as well. And I thought this was amazing. You know, no teachers breathing down my neck, no parents looking over my shoulder. As a 16-year-old kid growing up in South Florida, I thought, this is an amazing arrangement. I'm finally free to pursue whatever I want to pursue and do whatever I want to do. And the Bible makes it clear that sin is pleasurable for a season, but when that season comes to an end, you're left with a gaping hole in your soul that only God is big enough to fill. And that season came to an end for me at 21 years old when the hound of heaven tracked me down Mm. and magnificently defeated me. It wasn't one particular circumstance or or a particular crisis. It was just this culminating sense of there's got to be more to life than what I'm experiencing. There has to be more to who I am than what this world is telling me. And so God became real to me in a way that he had never been real to me before. At that time, I was dating a girl who became my wife, and um, she became a Christian at the same time. She didn't grow up in a Christian home, so this was all new to her. Uh, But for me, it was coming back to what I already knew. 
we got married at 21, uh, had our first child at 22, our second child at 24, our third child at 28. And, did you uh, figure out how that worked? I mean, did you... Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, the good news was by the time I was 28, I was done having children. <laughs> um, so now I am 43, and my oldest son is now 20, and he's newly married with a baby, so I'm a grandfather. So that's that's the plus of wow. um, you know, getting married young and having children young. But I immediately went to college. I started college at 22 years old. God gave me this overwhelming hunger and thirst to learn and to study and to read and and I had never been a good student up until that point, but uh, went to college, then went to seminary after college, knew without knowing exactly how I would do what God was calling me to do, I knew that I wanted to tell the whole world of this God that was so amazingly gracious and kind and merciful, one who would come after someone like me, one who was patient uh, and forbearing with me the way he was. Um, and continues to be. Uh, and so I spent the first seven years of our married life in school, um, graduated from seminary in May of 2001, moved to Knoxville, Tennessee, where I served as an associate pastor at a large church up there, ministering to everybody in their 20s and 30s. After being there for two years, a group of people from back home in South Florida called and asked if I would be interested in coming home to plant a church, which I said no. A thousand times I said no, I didn't want to do that. Uh, I mean, I'm a preacher and a people person, a pastor, but um, not an administrator, not someone that I thought could build something from the ground up. So I said no. Uh, they basically said, listen, you know, preachers are hard to find. Administrators are easy to find. You come preach and we'll handle the rest. So in the summer of 2003, my wife, Kim, and my three kids and I moved back home to South Florida and planted New City Church. And that church grew uh, we had an amazing experience at New City, and when that church was five years old, Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church came to me. Coral Ridge is a famous church in the Fort Lauderdale area. Sure. Dr. Um, D. James Kennedy. Dr. D. James Kennedy founded that church uh, in 1959 and um, became internationally famous because of Evangelism Explosion, which was an evangelistic tool that really took off in the 70s and 80s. Uh, he was a real pioneer when it came to radio and television and that sort of thing. Um, and so he had died in 2007. They had come to me and said, would you consider becoming the pastor here? And I said, listen, I'm honored, I'm humbled, but not interested at all. Uh, it was an older church, a very traditional church, a dying church, really. Um, and they came back to me a second time, and I said, again, I'm honored, I'm humbled, but I'm not interested. That's what I said to them. Inside, I'm thinking, you're crazy. No one wants this job. I'm the <laughs> last person that you want to come here. But your Wednesday um, night dinners are at 3.30 Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right. You could be out in time. Um <laughs> So they came to me a third time and said, would you consider merging the two churches? And that was just crazy enough for me to think maybe God was up to something. Hmm. So we went through a three-month meticulous due diligence process where there was a team of people from Coral Ridge and a team of people from New City along with me who went through every imaginable thing, looked under every rock and behind every tree, and at the conclusion of that three months realized uh, this is, in fact, what God is calling us to do. Hmm. Uh, we knew it was going to be hard. We knew it was going to be a battle. You merge anything and it's difficult. Merge two families, two businesses, whatever. Two churches, specifically two very different churches. Culturally. Well, you guys had pretty much the same worship style, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, very, very different in every imaginable way. Different demographic, different foundation uh, philosophically. Both were Presbyterian churches, but that's about all that they had in common. Um, I, Dr. Kennedy, as much as I respect him and was a good family friend, very, very different than me, stylistically, philosophically, that sort of thing. Um, so uh, we knew it was going to be hard, but we did it. And for the first probably 10 days, it was this amazing honeymoon. It was explosive. And I thought for one terribly naive second, wow, this may not be as hard as we thought it was going to be. And then after that 10-day period, the honeymoon wore off and the wars began uh, you know, to wage, really. Yeah, we actually, uh, I think part of that story is in the book we wrote on pastoral succession. Um, okay, yeah. Yeah, the book's yeah. called Next. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's right. one of the stories. Yeah, is that good story. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was a rough, that first six months of transition at Coral Ridge was probably the roughest time of my life until now, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, but was the roughest time in my life. I had always been in places where I was liked and appreciated and approved uh, and didn't realize that I had really come to find my worth and my security and my value 
in how much people liked me. Oh, wow. Because well, now I was at a place where there were lots of people who didn't like me and didn't want me there. Uh, and I was feeling like the skin was being ripped off my bones. I mean, mm. you just never realize how dependent you become on what other people think of you uh, until what other people think of you is bad. And what then a good it's word. exposed. That is a good word um, for pastors. And I remember wrestling with God and thinking during that time, God, you've ruined my life. I mean, I, we had a good church over here and now everything's falling apart. I mean, it was bad. The, the, it was really, really bad. Um, family was being attacked because my family's well known and the church is well known. It was all over the newspaper, all the all, you know, local news, na- international news, really, uh, TV. Everything was just covering all of the infighting going on at Coral Ridge. It was embarrassing. I was embarrassed. Uh, it was just bad press, all that stuff. And I remember wrestling with God and saying, "God, just give me my old life back." And I remember reading through Colossians, first chapter of Colossians, and it was through that chapter that. God said, it's not your old life you want back, it's your old idols you want back, and I love you too much to give those to you. Wow. And it was there that I realized how dependent I'd become on human approval and human acceptance to make me feel like I mattered. Um, and so God helped me rediscover the power of the gospel in a way that I had never known before. And everything changed for me at that point. Um, the... Uh, the way that I preached changed, the way that I pastored changed, the message specifically that I preached changed. And because it was so necessary for me to believe at a functional level that Jesus plus nothing equals everything, that the gospel isn't just the ABCs of the Christian faith, but the A to Z of the Christian faith, that it doesn't just save me from the past and it doesn't just save me for the future, but it saves me in the present from things like fear and longing for acceptance. The Mm. gospel says to me today, you are forever loved, forever accepted, forever approved. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, that nothing can separate us from God's love, that God's love for us and approval of us does not depend on us at all, but on what Jesus has done for us. That was a message I desperately needed to hear then, and it was a, it's a message I desperately need to hear now. Um, but that became the warp and woof of my preaching. I, I uh, went from having a gun that had maybe six bullets in it to a gun that had one bullet in it. Um, and I knew that I would spend the rest of my life saying the same thing in 10,000 different ways. And I think that, for me, that was sort of a paradigm shift. Instead of saying 10,000 different things... Uh, it got to the point for me that I wanted to say the same thing in 10,000 different ways. Um, And so Coral Ridge became known for a church, um, known as a church that preached the radicality of God's grace, the amazing, outrageous nature of God's mercy, uh, and it began to attract a different kind of person. Uh, Tim Keller once said, "If if you're not preaching, if you're not attracting the same kinds of people Jesus attracted, you're not preaching the same message that Jesus preached. And it became clear to me that God was rebuilding this church around a different kind of message, a message that's sadly all too absent in churches today. And so the church started to attract a very different demographic, Mm -hmm. not necessarily younger. It was, you know, red, yellow, black, white, old, young, rich, poor, you name it. I mean, millionaires, homeless people sitting next to each other. Uh, But all the people who were coming were aware of their desperate need for God's grace and realizing that they are far worse off than they think they are. But Mm -hmm. God's grace is infinitely greater than anything they could ever ask for or imagine. And so... So that's what Coral Ridge became. It became, it was the entire, we had seminary, school, radio station, the whole deal. And the entire institution really needed to be replanted. Wow. Uh, And it took a while to get there, uh, but God did an amazing work there. Let me stop right there. And uh, a lot of our listeners tune in to learn about building a staff culture. Mm -hmm. You probably had to change some things out. Oh, yeah. So what are some big learnings you took away from that? Yeah, we, um, and I, you know, gosh, before I got to Coral Ridge, I had maybe fired three or four people in my life. You know, I was never really comfortable with that kind of a thing. Much more comfortable hiring than I was firing, of course. I was, I was never licking my chops to fire people. Um, but, uh, when you realize that the church is not about, um, the decisions you make as a pastor for the church are not primarily based on what you like or don't like or what makes you feel comfortable or not, but it's for the betterment of the entire church. Um, You know, I had to make some tough decisions, um, and so I inherited a lot of staff. As a church merger, I brought staff with me, but I also inherited a lot of staff. 
uh, we had to basically reevaluate every staff person, whether they came from New City or Coral Ridge. Uh, we had to get a really good sense of who we wanted to be as a church and what kind of person we needed to have on staff. Uh, and so we we fired a lot of people in that first 18 months, and mm. I hated every single one of them, mm. every single one of them. Even those who were more belligerent, I hated because people's livelihoods are at stake. They've got family, they have you know all that stuff. They have bills to pay, and I hate putting anybody in that position. Uh, but we had to for the sake of the church. And I learned a couple things. Number one, hire slowly, fire quickly. We, <laughs> That's super important. We say that around here all the time. Yeah, well, yeah. it's so, so key to do that, at least in my experience. The second thing I learned was I would rather want what I don't have than have what I don't want wow. in terms That's of good. staffing. And I think sometimes we pastors... We recognize the need for help. We recognize the need for this particular hole to be plugged. And because it's burdening us to not have that hole plugged, we become too expedient in wanting to fill that hole. And so uh, we end up settling for hmm. something or someone less than what that position requires and what the church needs. And, and I've never made a bad staff decision by waiting. I have made lots of bad staff decisions by going too quickly. And so I just, you know, I would rather hold out, no matter how big the need is, I would rather hold out and wait for the right person than to settle and get the wrong person. Because once you baptize a person into leadership, you're stuck. I mean, you're stuck with their opinions. You're stuck with their thoughts. You're stuck with their work ethic. You're stuck with their character or lack thereof. You're stuck with whether or not the, the chemistry between them and the other team members are, is working. So the three things that we would always look at, that I would always look at, is competency. Obviously, or can they do the job um, that's being required? Uh, two is just character. Can I trust this person? Um, are they going to undermine the mission? Are they going to gossip? Are they going to build alliances behind closed doors? That sort of thing. Can I trust them? And then third, and maybe most importantly, believe it or not, is chemistry. Because you can have great competency and you can have great character, but if you don't jive with the other team, culture on staff is primary because it's going to filter down into the church as a whole. And if there's great camaraderie, great chemistry, great love at the top when it comes to the staff, that's going to inform the way the church functions. Yeah, and the church needs to see that. We've even gotten to where our cultural values are the matrix for evaluating staff mm. and their performance and their bonus. Right, yeah. So if you aren't living out the cultural values, yeah. you're not going to get paid. Right, yeah. That's, it's uh, that important. I think it yeah. trumps competency, yeah. frankly. Yeah. yeah, it really, because you can you can teach skill in many cases, depending on what the job requires. You can teach skill. Uh, chemistry is either you got it or you don't. Yeah. And you may you may have great chemistry with a team over here. So it's not, hey, you're, you're a person that doesn't possess any chemistry with anybody. It's just this may not be the right person for this particular yeah, group dynamic. Totally. That's, uh, in our, just very quickly, in our search work, we tell people that are saying, so what do you do? We say, well, it's like a heart transplant. Right. So it's not just finding a donor base of a bunch of hearts. Yeah. It's about doing a tissue match. Right. That's right. Because that's you, can exactly put a, right. you can put a healthy heart. Yeah. in a healthy body mm -hmm. and if they don't match everybody dies right that's right yeah that's exactly right oh. yeah that's exactly right cool well i pulled so, you off story to talk about teams but yeah fast forward a little bit mm -hmm. uh the church did start clicking and was growing and moving oh gosh the church was thriving i mean after the first six months you know all the bombs had gone off we were we spent the next year basically kind of assessing the damage cleaning up the carnage. The people who were opposed to me being there in the first place ended up leaving pretty quickly after that six month period of time and starting their own church. Um, so that was uh, sad for us, but also a relief because now we were able to sort of rebuild without that kind of opposition in our face all the time. Um, by the time we reached the two year mark, uh, the church was really beginning to click. We knew who we were. We knew what we were saying. We knew what we were about. We knew that we were we existed to declare and demonstrate the liberating power of the gospel. We knew our mission. We knew our vision. Uh, we rebranded the entire church in every imaginable way. Um, and uh, from that point on, it just really picked up steam big time. That lasted until basically I I resigned, which was back in uh, which was back in June now, beginning of June. Mm. Uh, painful subject, so mm. don't feel a uh, pressure to share or not share. But yeah. walk us through kind of how that happened, or or not even really the the details of how it happened, sure. but what you're learning from it. What yeah. uh, there are a lot of pastors out there who 
frankly, you know, most pastors in America pastor a church of about 100. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're listening, you're probably we're probably broadcasting this on a Monday, so you're probably filling out a resume. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> Mondays are horrible. It's a hard job. Mm-hmm. And people look at guys who are at the big churches mm-hmm. and think, well, nothing bad. I mean, that's the mm-hmm. glam life. But I've lived it. It's yeah. not. I think yeah. you would say the same thing. So yeah. walk us through a little bit of, of the... Uh, the last part of your time there and, yeah. and what you've learned since then. Yeah, and, and um, I would assume that most of your listeners have probably heard the story or read at least a portion of the story because it was broadcast internationally. But back in June, beginning of June, I resigned from my position at Coral Ridge after admitting to having an affair. I had come home from a trip three months earlier and uh, discovered some things about what was going on in my own marriage that shocked me and surprised me. Uh, And uh, at that point, my wife and I separated. And during that time of separation, I ended up getting involved with a girl that I should not have, obviously. Mm. And, um, and I think I'm, I'm at a place now where I'm, I shouldn't be shocked at myself because I have a very low anthropology. Theologically Mm -hmm. speaking, I, I believe that we are far worse off than we think we are. Um, but still, it's one thing not to be shocked at other people's sins. Um, that was the one thing I was convinced I would never do. Mm. I knew that I would be, I knew that I could be lured by this or that or the other. Uh, but I had always had a really big sort of guard up. I knew that that was a career killer, at least in my experience with pastors and church leaders. And it was a short lived thing, it wasn't a long thing. Um, but it was, it, it was the worst. Um, you know, the worst external decision I had ever made in my life, I have ever made in my life up until this point. And I'm wrestling with the aftermath of that. Mm. I'm trying to figure out what does life look like at, from this point forward. Uh, I'm trying to evaluate. It's so tempting when you go through something like this. I've been amazingly tempted to dig in my heels. I've struggled with anger, with frustration, anger with God, anger with my wife anger with the church, trying in some way, shape, or form without even being conscious of it to locate blame for my bad decision on something or someone outside of me. Mm. And one of the things that God is really forcing me to face is that I, I knew I was bad. I didn't know I was this bad. I, uh, I think when I went through the transition at Coral Ridge, uh, it was obviously, you know, rough, but we rebounded from that. God opened up a lot of doors, uh, gave me a significant platform, writing books and television stuff and traveling and speaking in conferences. And I just, I became, um, I became a different person, hmm. not consciously. I, hmm. I don't think I, anyone who knew me well, I don't think would have been interacting with me and thought, but it's very, very subtle and very, very tempting to believe your own press. Um, yes. To believe that uh, you are more important than you think you are and that this whole thing is riding on you. And for me, and this is sort of an embarrassing admission, but as I've reflected on it now, for me, after the transition of Coral Ridge, the message became the most important thing for me because it was the message that was saving me every single day. Mm. Um but then I became known for being the guy who preaches that message. I became widely known as sort of the spokesperson for grace, you know, and that oh, sort of thing. Oh, and the breadth of your message. I mean, I remember you yeah. came here to Houston and spoke at a large, very traditional Episcopal church, mm-hmm. and then you took off and went to New York City and <laughs> were at, at a crazy contemporary <laughs> yeah, church, right. wonderful church there. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And so I, I, I've never been sort of in a particular tribe. I've, I've seen myself as more of an evangelist in that regard. Um, but you start, for me, uh, the messenger became more primary than the message. And it happened so subtly, you don't even see it. You don't even recognize it. And when all of this blew up, when I came home and discovered uh, what my wife had been doing and was blown away, shocked. And then uh, I ended up doing what I did. Um, I, I go, what what kind of a person have I become? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I'm not blaming me necessarily. We're, we're all responsible for the decisions we make. I'm not blaming me for the decisions that my wife made. And I'm not blaming my wife for the decisions that I made. Um, but I look at this and go, what kind of person did I become um, for me to do what I did? 
for my wife to do what she did, um, where did I fail? I mean, where did I fail? I, did I become something or someone that I didn't even see I was becoming? Um, and those are the things I'm wrestling with. I am, uh, I, I've always been a preacher of the radicality of God's grace and how it is unconditional one-way love that comes our way minus our merit. Um, and man, I can preach that. I can write about that. I can talk about that. Um, having to believe that right now is probably my greatest struggle. It's so easy for me to believe that God's love is dependent on who we are and how we behave and how we perform. Um, and if that's the case, then I'm screwed right now mm. because I, my behavior, my attitude, what I'm doing, not doing, all of that stuff um, is worthy of God's categorical rejection and condemnation. Um, and so for me, the biggest challenge is uh, living in light of the grace that God has given me, believing the gospel. It's so hard to believe the gospel. It's easy to believe the gospel when things are going well, and you actually think you're doing pretty well. Of course God loves me. I mean, look at what I'm doing. Look at the yeah. people that I'm reaching. Look at the, all this stuff. Um, when everything comes crashing down and you're face-to-face -face with your humanness in a way you've never been face-to-face -face with it before, and you're embarrassed, you're ashamed, you're guilty, you um, it's hard to believe that God loves you mm. and that you're justified and that you're accepted and approved because of what Jesus has done. And so my hope and my prayer for me and my family and my life going forward, regardless of what I end up doing, is that I would get God's grace at a much deeper level than I could have ever gotten it if he had not allowed this to happen. Mm. Um, and... I've got such a hard head. <laughs> I'm so arrogant and I've got such a hard head um, that in order for me to learn some of this stuff, God had to hit me across the jaw with a two by four. And so I would just, you know, selfishly ask your listeners to just be praying for me and for my family. My kids have responded to me. We've got it. We've actually, believe it or not, even though this explosion has gone off, uh, we've always had a tight family. And so the family is stuck together, but these are hard days and, mm. um, and I have uh, decent days, and I have really, really bad days, and I experience dark nights of the soul in a way that I've never experienced before. Uh, despair, wondering if there's a future. Um, I, I never could fully understand why people would take their own life. Um, and while I have not been, thankfully, by God's grace, tempted to do so, I, for the first time, understand why you get you I get, get it. I get the desperation I get the despair wow. uh, in a way that I never have I don't get it nearly as much as some people who are suffering much greater than I am get it uh, but I get it compared to anything I've experienced before well uh, we wish you the best man Thank and you. I you know we're we're constantly seeing uh, churches come to us after uh, something's happened where the pastors left abruptly mm -hmm. And the church thinks there's no future. The guy who left for whatever reason mm. it was uh, thinks there's no future. And and while your situation, I mean, I'm not uh, minimizing the the errors you made and, mm. and leaving the church. On the, the drama meter we see around here, mm -hmm. you're pretty low. Okay, so, well, that's good to hear. You know, I, yeah, I, I yeah. can tell you some things yeah. that might make you go jump off the... <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, right. But uh, in, in mm. all seriousness, I, I've, I've always seen that's the mm. time that the Holy Spirit really dives mm. in and says, yeah. let me show you how gracious I really yeah. am. Yeah. And I, I, I hope, mm. I think uh, when we visited earlier, some people have reached out to you you mm -hmm. never would have thought. Yeah, that's right. So, so, there's, so it's amazing. I've been so uh, encouraged uh, by the church. Um in terms of the way people have responded for the most part. And, you know, I, my biggest struggle, William, I, we've talked about this, but my biggest struggle has been how do I steward this catastrophe? Mm -hmm. um, because everything in me wants to run away and hide. You know, I want to vanish. I, I want to be anonymous. I want to vanish. I never want to see another microphone or another platform again on most days. Um, but if I disappear and hide completely uh, so that I only let people see me when I'm strong and shiny and not weak and broken and messed up and bad, um, then I, I'm undermining the very message that I spent years preaching. And so as hard as this is for me, and I'm not pastoring a church and I'm not seeking and I'm not writing any books right now, I'm not seeking any uh, platform of any sort, um, but the, the platform that God has given me um, 
something like this, Twitter, Facebook, stuff like that. Um, I want to I want to let people in to see me walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I, mm. I think it's important. I think lots of times Christian leaders will fall like this, and um, people see them when they're strong. They fall. They disappear. They brush their teeth. You know, comb their hair, uh, polish their shoes. Um, you know, press their shirt, and then they come back on stage where everyone sees them strong and mighty again with a story to tell. I, I want, not that I want people to see me this way. I think it's important for people to see me uh, broken mm -hmm. um, and weak and struggling and saying, you know, most days I don't feel like praying. Um, and I get it because most lots of people out there don't feel like praying on lots of days. Um, you know, I, I, I struggle with being angry with God. Why you, You're God. You could have stopped this. Why didn't you? Now, look, is this really good? How could this be good? Uh, look at the negative impact it's had. Blaming God, blaming my wife, blaming, wanting to shift blame. I, mean, I, I People need to see the message that I preached lived. Mm. Um, and part of what it means to live in light of this message is I'm free to let you see me at my worst. The gospel wow. sets me free to let you see me at my worst, not just at my best, but at my worst because, because I'm at the bottom and because grace always flows to the lowest point and because Jesus is meeting me at the bottom. Um, and because I want you to see Jesus, I'm happy to give you a sneak peek into, uh, sort of the messiness of my world right now. Um, and I know some people will interpret that as well. He's grandstanding or trying to seek the spotlight again. And they can think that. And there's nothing I can do about that. Um, and who knows? Maybe there's a part of that that's true down deep somewhere. Um, I know that I'm worse than I think I am. But for the most part, as far as I can tell, I just, I really, the message, I want the message to be about Jesus. And, mm -hmm. um, and I want that to be primary. I saw the destruction that took place when the messenger became primary. And for the message to become primary, for him to increase and for me to decrease, I, I feel a responsibility to let people see me at my worst um, hmm. so that they can see God at his best. That's powerful. And we don't, you know, we're, we're recording this. Honestly, the safe thing to do would be to wait three years and right. have you come back. But yeah. I have come to believe that nearly every church is run by a person who's in desperate need of a savior. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we absolutely. are all a mess. Yeah. And I, I know thousands of people mm. are watching to mm. see you handle this well and mm. pulling for you. I know Thank this, you. And, and this is a word to those of you listening out there. Uh, I've watched people fall who preached an angry message. Mm. They don't have an, as many friends when they're trying to recover. Mm. Then I watch somebody like my friend Tullian, who's been preaching a message of grace, mm -hmm. and while he's trying to recover, and we mm. still don't know the outcome of right. where things are going to go, mm. there are people surrounding him with grace. If mm. you make grace what you lead with and finish with, mm. no matter what you do in life, mm. friends are going to respond graciously. That's right. So mm. thanks so much for tuning in. It's a little bit different episode for us, but I hope God's used it in a great way. Keep working on building and running and keeping your teams and keep moving forward and let's we'll storm down the gates of hell. Thanks for listening to today's podcast. You can connect with us on Twitter at VanderblumenSG and hashtag your key takeaways with hashtag Vandercast. You can also receive more information about what we do here at Vanderblumen Search Group and notes from today's podcast at vanderblumen.com backslash podcast. See you next time.